Today, ever more machines pass up and down our countryside reclaiming land. Land which can grow only poor grasses, tussocks and unpalatable stuff. Barren, heather-covered hills. Land where hedges creep out over the fields. Or where bracken is the only crop. All these are problems that can be solved now and which, with regular maintenance, might have been prevented. The problem for many farmers is that of badly drained fields on flat, low-lying country, which year after year hardly pay a return for all the work hours expended. Pools of water lie on the surface and unwanted sedges grow. A problem like this has a solution. An expert at drainage, such as Mr. Martinson, a farmer himself, can size up the site and produce a plan which, with a government grant, will be within reach of the farmer's pocket and which will transform his land. The first move of the contractor is to check the weed-covered and silted-up main drains, too often the originator of the trouble. Once let go, the ever-increasing effort needed to clear them leads to putting off the day until such sites as this are only too common. Then the theodolites come out and the exact rise and fall of the ground is plotted so that a first rough plan can be prepared for the tile draining of the field into the main drain. If the plan for improvement is agreed by the Ministry, a substantial grant will be allowed on the work, but before such a grant can be obtained, the rough sketch has to be changed into an exact scale plan, giving lengths, distances apart, and estimates of overall cost. The plan passed and cost agreed, work begins on the main drain first, for all the lateral channels made later must run off into this. Here a priestman with a side drag line is used. This machine, skillfully controlled by the hands of an expert operator, can clear the worst silted up ditches and have the water running in a very short time and at an economic cost. It has a great capacity for work and will clear about a chain an hour of this type of ditch, allowing a very reasonable costing to even the most hopeless looking jobs. But not all farmers who have drainage problems suffer with low-lying land like the Holderness Peninsula and need large-scale operations by contractors to keep them out of trouble. For the more normally sighted farm, this Stanhay Ditchmaster made to fit most tractors and which can be worked by farm labour, is an attractive and cheap tool within the farmer's reach. The grab is opened and closed, lowered and raised hydraulically by the tractor driver, with a mate to swing the grab to the right position. It can cut completely new ditches, but it is cheaply a clearance machine. For the farmer who wants to keep his labour occupied on farm maintenance during the slack periods, this can be a profitable accessory. So too is the sapper cleaner made by Bomford and Evershed, which needs only one operator. It takes about half an hour to attach to the tractor and can be dismantled again easily by removing the release pins when the machine has to be taken long distances or stolen. Any medium-powered tractor that is fitted with hydraulics can work the sapper. different soils, different buckets are provided, and this one is the skeleton bucket for heavy clay land, made so that the soil doesn't cling to it, and which leaves a clean, circular-shaped drain along which water will easily flow. But even if many farms are too small to justify owning such an implement, there are contractors with machines like this Barford Linko cleaner, which does a good job at an economic rate. An experienced operator, can clear unobstructed ditches with one run of the machine up to 30 chains in an hour. But average work is carried out generally at about 80 chains in a working day, allowing for several runs of the machine and moving from one site to another. Very wet conditions can make this work more difficult for this type of team since it travels only a few feet away from the edge of the ditch. But back at the Holderness Peninsula, 
Mr. Martinson's priestman has a long 26-foot jib, allowing the machine to stand well back and to avoid too close a contact with the banks around the ditches. On this large-scale operation, as soon as the main drains are free, a start is made on the tile drainage of the field itself to the exact plans already drawn up. Carefully set leveling boards ensure that there is always a slight gradient to the drain. Many fields have to be drained halfway in one direction and then have their outfall changed to meet rises of ground. Great care is taken to see that the water always flows to this outfall, which cuts right across the line of drain which are themselves spaced at approximately 10 yard intervals. Tiles are then laid, the outfall tile having holes cut in it to allow the lateral drains to flow easily into it. Finally, the outfall itself flows to the main drain. many farmers, this must seem a large and costly drainage scheme outside their pockets. But when carried out by a well-organized and skillful contracting firm with the help of government subsidy, there are farmers all over the country who are today reaping full crops on land which previously lay heavy with water and little else. There are many types of drainage machines available, from the simple mole plough, useful for the farmer himself, to a range of specialist machines for the contractor. This one, made by the Coopers of Leicester, is of interest since it consists of a mole bullet, and behind the mole share is attached a huge pair of expanding plates, which sink into the ground as the mole is pulled along. The tiles are usually laid between two and a half to three feet deep, and the plates hold the ground open long enough for the tiles to be laid between them. to pull the machine comes from a tractor anchored firmly against the strain and working through a winch. Three men are needed to lay the tiles, but it is a very speedy machine and an average cost is 37 and sixpence a chain. Tiles are fed down through a chute where they are tucked into the right position in the channel. The tremendous shattering which occurs underground to a depth of five feet also helps the general drainage. The same firm has devised a method for use where it is important to disturb the surface of the ground as little as possible. An ordinary mole channel is made and every 80 yards a hole is dug and a tile pusher is inserted. This gives both the simplicity of an ordinary mole drain allied to the much greater efficiency of the tile drain. People such as the Coopers are always looking for new ways of doing things. And in the Scottish Hills, James Cuthbertson has long established himself as a specialist in draining bog land. All over the world, many hillsides, at present waterlogged and nearly valueless, can be brought to a much higher state of fertility at an economic price, with the use of this water buffalo tractor and large open drainer, especially designed for the job. Carving huge trenches, which will remain clear for up to 10 years, the immediate drainage effect is startling. Having drained this type of hill land, better grasses and clover can now survive. And to introduce them, a new machine, a sod seeder, has been developed. Even when drained, much land cannot be economically ploughed and reseeded. So the idea here is to produce a seed drill which will also disc shallow channels two feet apart and into which can be spread seed and fertilizer from the distributors attached. The fertilizer helps the grass and creeping clover to get a good start so that they will be able to live with and expand to the surrounding soil. Here on heather covered hills, the young clover is making a good showing soon after seeding. This method, first tried out in remote places like the Falkland Islands, has still development work to be done, but its possibilities are obviously great. The unpleasant fact 
that it is only coarse and useless grasses which survive on poorly drained land becomes obvious on flood meadows like these, which are badly cared for. They usually degenerate into something like this, a dense mass of tussock about three feet high, of very little value and extremely difficult to get rid of. To help farmers who are trying to reclaim this kind of land, the Agricultural Research Council's unit of the Department of Agriculture at Oxford and the National Agricultural Advisory Service are carrying out spraying tests with Dalapon and Aminotriazol. Working over carefully measured out plots, they hope to be able to find the best way of killing off the tussocks, to gain experience in dealing with the large quantities of dead material left and to reseed the land. Varying strengths of the chemical are used, and in the following spring, the results are obvious. The strongest spray gives a complete kill. The weakest kills some of the tussocks, but leaves other unharmed, and the unsprayed goes on flourishing. The dead tussocks are left for a dry spell, and then can be burned off. But whether burned off or not, the dead grasses are then rotivated on the surface to about an inch deep. On this seed bed, fertilizer is placed and then a variety of palatable seeds are sown. Although at this stage, they haven't resolved all the problems, this new method of reseeding difficult land is approaching the point of practical farming possibility. As with tussocks, other unwelcome inhabitants of low-lying land are sedge, reeds, and rushes. Some of the plants can now be killed off with chemical sprays. And here at St. Neots, they are preparing to treat an 11-acre field with an MCPA product. Soft rush is easier to control, since it has a soft, pithy center, which quickly absorbs the chemical. Obviously, getting rid of rushes is only the beginning of this type of reclamation, but usually it must be followed by drainage. Difficulties frequently arise in getting the spray machine onto such waterlogged land. And under these circumstances, helicopter spraying provides the answer. Tussocks and rushes are a problem on low-lying land. But bracken is a more widespread difficulty, which farmers either tackle in a variety of ways or are apt to give up altogether. At Erich Park near Tunbridge Wells, they are reclaiming 800 acres of land which has been bracken covered since doomsday. And their method for this large acreage is one that the majority of farmers could use for themselves. The first ploughing is tackled with a single furrow, 16 inch plough, which does a good job despite the very heavy going. A deep digger is essential for getting right under the long bracken roots and turning them out to rot. For the policy is to kill the bracken by exposing the roots to the weather. The land is left for a few weeks and is then broken out by a two-furrowed disc plant, so that once again the roots are turned out and left to the air. For whilst there is any juice left in the root, it can grow out again. This is the sort of thing that a worker can do between his other routine jobs, gradually bringing a piece of wasteland under control. Once again, the land is left until the roots begin to look really black and withered. Then disc harrowing begins. It's in this way that the soil is worked and reworked, harrowed and cross harrowed, until the bracken roots are dead and something like a seed bed is prepared and all done by using gear which can be found on the majority of farms. There on the hillside in the distance grows the result of this reclamation, a fairish crop of late sown winter oats where there was only bracken last year. Here is a field of barley coming up towards harvest time. And what's unusual about that? Only that this crop is the result of yet another type of land reclamation wood clearance. All over the country, on many farms, there are wasteful copses and woods of no forestry value, which experienced contractors like Jack Beaver can bring under cultivation at an economic price. But the story doesn't start with the boulders. For first, a scheme must be got out to which the Ministry will approve a grant. Contracting for this type of work is a ticklish business, and there are many snags and pitfalls for the unwary or inexperienced. The field next door to the job will give the contractor a good idea of the type of soil likely to be found. 
A light soil will make the job easier, and a heavy clay will mean a hard business of dragging out the big roots. Next, he goes into the copse to find the size and type of timber involved. Experience tells him just how long a young oak like this will take to knock out. All these facts, density, size of timber, and so on, go down as notes to be worked out later on. Undergrowth is given a careful check, and particular attention is paid to harmless-looking clumps, which may well shelter old tree stumps. Failure to notice them at this stage may put the contractor in serious trouble later on. The estimate must satisfy all three parties. The ministry, from whom a grant will be obtained, the farmer, who will have to pay the rest, and the contractor, who hopes to make a profit. Only when all three are satisfied is the bulldozer let loose. From its very name, it sounds as though all the operator has to do is crash his way through, leaving a trail of torn up trees and scrub in his wake. But it is on the skill of this man that the success or failure of the contract can rest. Whipped and lashed by springy young saplings, his constant preoccupation is to remove all the undergrowth with the least possible disturbance to the topsoil. This can only be done by easing the various obstacles out of the ground, and not by bulldozing. smaller stuff cleared out of the way, the operator starts on any standing timber there may be. Here again, careful prodding at the trunk ensures that as many roots as possible are broken off, so that once again the topsoil is as little disturbed as need be. Trunks of all the larger trees are then cut up to be used as timber for various uses about the farm, whilst all the scrub and small trees are pushed into large heaps by the bulldozer and burnt. Reclamation of this kind, expertly carried out by contractors who know their job, can bring back into cultivation not only large copses and unwanted woodlands such as this, but the kind of waste that occurs on many a farm, the hedgerow that has got out of hand. Every year the plough goes a little wider as the brushwood extends, and every year more land is lost to cultivation. Seen here after the hedge has been cleared, but with plenty still left as a windbreak, the area which this farmer has been losing to useless hedges and scrub over the years is plainly visible. Back on the larger reclamation scheme, one of the last remaining jobs is to get rid of the many old tree trunks. There is nothing left for the bulldozer to get hold of, and so preparations are made to blow them up. Only experience tells just how much of a charge each particular kind of trunk is going to need.
With these last obstacles to cultivation removed, a crawler with a heavy ripper is pulled over the ground, bringing up all the pieces of root which have been left in the land. These will then be broken into yet smaller pieces by a powerful set of disc harrows and left to rot away during the course of a few years. And so, less than a month after starting the job, seven acres of waste woodland have been transformed into productive farmland, which in less than a year is bearing a profitable crop of spring barley. But even if scrub or waste woodland is not your problem, it may be bracken. draining a hillside, or getting seeds to grow in infertile surroundings. It may be large-scale drainage and tile laying, or merely looking after your own ditches with your own equipment. Tussocks, or tree stumps. Though you may not have a bluebell wood to turn into a cornfield, there may be some part large or small on your farm, which reclaimed will give you greater production and greater profits.